you know, and one of the things you should be comfortable with is knowing that to an extent, if you come from a family that has a bit more money, you are going to have an easier time and less boundaries and issues to deal with than the students that are working two jobs to help support their families who come from, you know, uh, they're all first generation college students. Um, that's just the reality. The system favors the people that can afford to take these pre-college programs, these classes for SAT prep, and you know, that's what it is at the end of the day. It's, of course, every single person that is admitted that doesn't have the whole varsity blues <laughs> kind of situation absolutely deserves to be admitted into school. But the playing field is not level and we should stop pretending like it is. This is the portfolio that I used to try and get into Cornell with and succeeded. There are parts of it that are so embarrassing that I'm not ready to openly talk about it on the internet. But from what you can see is I was really interested in Japan and I like to draw a lot. When you apply to architecture school, they're not looking for you to already know everything about architecture. That's why you're going to school. Instead, they want to know what makes you tick and what you're really interested in. But when you're applying to an Ivy League, there's a whole bunch of other things at play that you have to consider beyond just your portfolio. Have you ever wondered what it's actually like to get into the illustrious Ivy League? Well, wonder no more because today I'm going to talk about what I went through to try and get accepted into Cornell University's architecture program. This video goes out to all of you teenagers right now that are struggling with online classes, trying to figure out how the heck you're gonna get accepted. Um, wow, that sucks. Like seriously, I, at least I didn't have to deal with like a global pandemic when I was trying to get into school. And one of the things I have here, even after moving to the Netherlands, I mean, you can see it kind of actually, is um, I have a binder here full of stuff that is from high school that I brought with me first to Denmark and now here also has like my birth certificate and stuff. So we're gonna look back in history at time and see what kind of person I was in high school. So first of all, this is the admissions letter I got back in 2012, I wanna say. Yeah, it was 2012. Um, really nice. Wow, this stationery must have cost a lot of money. Like, look at that ribbon, that's like so sweet. Um, and I actually got two admissions letters because I deferred for a year to go on my gap year for reasons that I'm soon to discuss. But my high school years were not very, very fun. I was on the swim team, so I would, <laughs> would get up really early all the time, 4 a.m. sometimes, and head to swim practice from like the ages of 14, and then I would do a second swim practice after school. <laughs> The time I entered high school, I was in all honors classes. So for my European viewers, it's kind of like high school is kind of a smorgasbord, pick your own classes kind of deal in the States, where you kind of can pick the level of difficulty that you want to do. And so it starts with honors classes, and then in my school it went from honors to accelerated classes. Um, and then at the highest level you have what are known as AP classes, and if you take those classes, and you take a special placement exam, that class is supposed to supplement a college course, um, but it's up to the universities themselves to decide if they want to accept that for college credit or if they want to make you pay for the course. So what used to be a way to try and knock out some of your classes in high school has become another way to profit off of students. I'm digging through here. Yeah, I mean, I was a varsity swimmer. Ooh, look at that. Um, I also, I was really deeply interested in history, so I took like AP history and I took AP 
language. Um, I have a, I have I essay here that I wrote. Um, we to prepare for the AP exam, we basically had to like memorize all this these facts and stuff, and just sit down in class and write this essay. So the prompt was. Evaluate and analyze the extent to which Catherine the Great's leadership followed Machiavelli's political philosophy from the prince. Um, so I wrote something like, Catherine the Great paralleled Marie Antoinette in several ways. Both were princesses born outside of the country. They would later rule. Both were child brides. However, while Marie Antoinette fritted away her power as Queen of France, Catherine strengthened hers, going from queen to empress of Russia. Can kind of tell that like I had flair back in high school and that's really the point that I want to try and make is that the ultimate way if you are looking to get accepted into one of these high-level institutions is that you should follow what you're interested in and follow what you're passionate about you shouldn't try and change yourself too much to please admissions people who honestly at the end of the day don't even know you um, this is something I went through with my Cornell portfolio. One of the biggest things they told us on day one was, you know who your favorite architect is? It can't be Frank Lloyd Wright. Don't tell us a story about how you like to play at Legos as a child. And no fan art is allowed in your portfolio and that includes any manga or anime drawings. Now manga as a style is not necessarily fan art and I had spent many years developing my own, I guess you could say manga style. and even trying to come up with my own comic books and express myself in that way. But that was deemed to be unacceptable for my portfolio for school. So I suddenly had to come up with a bunch of portfolio material and I didn't even realize that I wanted to study architecture until I was 16. So I hadn't even taken art classes in high school. So I was suddenly competing against people that had taken art classes and were going to be in AP art their senior year, which where you create a huge portfolio um, of work that you can also then use in your application portfolio. So I found myself at a disadvantage in that way. However, I was really lucky because I grew up in the right neighborhood in America with the right parents who decided to invest in me doing something called summer college. Now, summer college is a way to do a pre-university course to see and try out different things and see if it's right for you. Cornell University has one. And it's a very well-known fact that if you do this summer college program, you will be exposed to some of the teachers, including the teachers that make the final decisions on the portfolios. In addition to this, you're going to learn exactly how Cornell University wants their students to design and think about the world. So I enrolled for this, I think $3,000, maybe it was even $5,000, I don't, I don't remember, program, age 17, I wanna say. And knowing very little about architecture, this soon became 50% of my portfolio. And I also got to know the head professor that would later become the professor of my entire first year. So yeah, I mean, really what I just wanna say is like, <laughs> it's all kind of BS. It's all kind of who you know, and you know, to an extent, I mean, I had, the right scores, I had the right grades, I took the classes, I, you know, was a wonderful student, I was varsity swim team, I was, you know, but I mean, when you're competing against a thousand kids, knowing only 50 of you are going to be selected, these are the things that kind of weigh an influence. And again, what I really want to stress is, think about yourself as an individual. Think about what you're interested in. Think about what makes you unique compared to other people. Your interests, your hobbies, your, your friends, your family, your history, your family history. These are all things that set you apart that make you interesting. So I see all these videos about your stats, like you're some sort of robot, you know, I got this on the SAT, I got this on my AP scores. Like at the end of the day, 10 years out, none of that stuff matters. It doesn't even matter that I went to Cornell because that's like at the bottom of my CV. And I can tell you everyone in Europe is like, I don't know what that is.
<laughs> so in terms of me being able to get a job, it ultimately did not help a lot. What helped was who I was as a person, my interests, my you know curiosity, um, my passion. And that comes across a lot more than whatever fancy school you went to. And I know, like, this is your whole life right now. I, I get that. I really do. Because it was my whole life back in high school. But take this time, especially with the pandemic and everything, to connect with your family, connect with your friends, and try not to get consumed by the rat race. Do what you have to do to get where you want to be. But I'm here to tell you that you are wonderful just the way you are and all this stuff in the long run, it really doesn't matter. If you want to be an architect, the only thing that matters is that you have the diploma from a university. And in the US, if you want to be licensed, probably from a, I think an NCARB university. That's all that matters.